I've got a, I've got a, a, a message from a good buddy of mine that uh, Tia is going to put on the screen up here. So enjoy. you've ever thought about it, when he makes that speech, out of, when he, he recites Luke, because it was out of Luke that he's reciting that, he drops his blanket. When he says, fear not, the Savior has come, he drops his blanket. That, that shows that Christ is his security. Christ came this week. And so as we, we need to realize that what he's talking about right there, that Charlie Brown is so frustrated because he's caught up in the Christmas play and he got the tree that... Well, we all know the tree bless his heart. We can say that because it's the South who bless that little tree's heart. He was so frustrated because nothing was working. And then he's just out of frustration. What is this all about? Linus says, I'll tell you what it's about. I'm like, Psh, it's no big deal. He walks out there. Fear not, drops his blanket because Christ is coming. That's what it's all about. It's celebrating our Savior. So this morning, let's just raise and praise him. It is his birthday. It is Jesus' birthday this week, and we all like to celebrate birthdays, so I want us to sing and praise, and if you want to clap, clap, if you want to kneel, kneel, close your eyes, whatever you want to do, and just praise the King of Glory, because he came down this week for each and every one of us, so we can, when we get stressed out, when we get nervous, when we get afraid, we can drop our blankets, because he's there for us at all times. <laughs>
star was shining in the sky. Below in Bethlehem, the king is sleeping. Oh, what a glorious night. I said, oh, what a glorious night. Go ahead have a seat or stand if you prefer. I'm giving you permission to sit down. Uh, you sound wonderful today. I hear the singing back. Isn't it good to hear them singing back to you? Mm -hmm. All right. Um, so I do want to, a couple things, quick notes I want to tell you and share with you. If at any point you guys are great uh, with, with this, I just want to make sure you know. We do have coffee this morning and OJ, some OJ and water back there. Uh, at any point, if, as long as your parents let you and you want some more, help yourself to it. Okay. Um, all that too. That, that's still there. The food was great. Wonderful guys. Thank you for all that. I do want to, um, and, and I didn't tell her I was going to do this. I do want to mention, uh, thank Cassie real quick. She, she, she came and decorated and the tablecloths and all those decorations made it look extra festive. So thank Cassie for that. And, and, and so let her know. We appreciate that. Okay. Um, and thank you for all supplying food and all everything. A couple of you mentioned why people do this every week. Um, you know, it's a lot to it. Just so you know. All right, we, we may try to do it every so often. Let's put it that way. Uh, but we may not attempt it every week. All right, we'll, we'll look at that. We got some flexibility there. So I do want to say welcome and thank you for joining us for worship today um, as we celebrate the birth of, of, of Christmas, of Christ. Um, we're still in our series, Unexpected Christmas. And so um, we'll, we'll wrap that up today and move on from there, okay? I think that's. I'll go over the rest of the announcements toward the end of the service. Um, if you did not get an outline and you want one, they're, they're up here as well. Um, also, kids' sheets. There are two sheets today. Um, there's a word search and there's a coloring sheet, right? Uh, and I do. I am aware of the same picture you colored last week, but you can color it again, wow. right? All right. And so there's that. And so if you want either one of those, they're there. Adults, you can have one of those too if you prefer. Okay. So Jay, you can have a coloring sheet yes. for word. So let, let, I'm going to hand things back over to Jay. He's going to continue to lead us in worship as we um, sing praises to God.
so much for that night. And give us, giving us the opportunity to tomorrow to see the Christmas star, to actually live and see what we think the shepherds saw in the sky. It's just, it's an amazing year. It's been a crazy year, but it's, it's just, you just continue to come through and, and surprise us and just, you're, you bless us each and every day. We're upright, we're breathing, we're celebrating, we're singing. We got a roof over our heads and food in our bellies. You always take care of us, Father. And just thank you and we praise you just for that. But as we continue this week in this sermon, Father, may we just continue to wish you a happy birthday and sing, sing praises to you. Continue to speak to us, lead us, and change us. We love you and thank you so much for your sacrifice and your love for us. In your name we pray, Lord. Amen. We have one song, but my good friend whom I've never met before, Laura Dag Dag Daigle. I can't even pronounce her name correctly. I'm sorry if you're watching. She's going to lead us in a way in a manger and lead us right into a Brian sermon for this morning. So, or what child is this? I'm sorry, wrong song. What child is this? And so the words will be up there. So if you still want to sing, praise Jesus, go for it. Some of them just going to refer to 
you want to write down some of the references, let me know. If you missed one, uh, I said one, if you raise your hand at me and say, oh, I need that, that scripture, I, I'll give it to you. Just let me know. I'll stop and go back and get it. Okay? The first one I want to read to you is Philippians chapter 2, verse 8. Jason, did I give you that one? All right. I may ask that a lot, okay? Um, being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Say, wait, what does that have to do with Christmas? We'll get there. What child is this who laid to rest on Mary's lap is sleeping? As, as a child, I was not impressed with that Christmas song, okay? A Christmas song that asks a question to which everyone already knew the answer. What child is this really? What child is this? I mean, it's Jesus. Of course, we know that. Even kids know that. That's Jesus. What I didn't know then, though, that questions aren't just for solving problems and for requesting new information. Sometimes questions are to make a point. And we call those what? Rhetorical questions. Okay? So that's our first point today. What child is this? Unexpected Christmas, we're looking at the unexpected Savior today. What child is this? At, at other times, the form of a question expresses awe and wonder about something we know to be true, but find almost too good to be true. It's too good to simply say it's directly like we say everything else. When the disciples found themselves, for example, in this great massive windstorm out on, on, on the sea, with the waves breaking into the boat, crashing in, and Jesus spoke a word and calmed the storm. He said, peace, be still, boom, it stopped. They said to one another, they looked at each other. Here's what they said. Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? That's Mark 4, 41. They knew from Scripture. They knew that only God himself could still the seas. Psalms 65, 89, Psalms 107, okay? That's somehow this person had to be God among them. But it was too wonderful to say they couldn't bring themselves to the word. They couldn't say, this is God. They said, who is this that can calm the storm? That even the seas obey him. That this revelation of Jesus' glory was too suspendous. To be, they couldn't keep it quiet. Too remarkable not to express in some form was indeed God himself in the boat with them. Who then is this? In, in similar vein, we ask in this song, what child is this? We know the answer. It, it's been plainly revealed. God himself has become man and this child and has come to rescue us. You see, the eternal word has become flesh to dwell among us. And that, it, it is clear and certain. We must say it straightforwardly and with courage. And yet, it's almost too wonderful to be true. So it's fitting at times like Christmas to wonder, to marvel, to ask at all, what child is this? What prompts this statement of question, it's not only that God has become man, but what, that he, he come among us in this fashion, in this way. You see, it's in surprising loveliness. The first stanza gives us the glory we expect. Angels greet him with anthems sweet. The heavens are alight with song. They're, they're singing. That, that's the kind of arrival we expected, this announcement of the Messiah. But there's a glimpse of the unexpected here. The angels, who are they singing to? We talked a little bit about it last week. They're singing to shepherds. I mean, that's off. Angels, yes, we get, but shepherds? Shouldn't there be dignitaries? Some of the regal and the religious statement establishment of the Jews, the religious leaders who, who are longly purposely waiting for the coming of the Christ? Shouldn't shepherds take a number behind, behind the king and his court, the priests and the scribes and the, the elite of Jerusalem? The unexpected is in the first stanza, but it's also in the second that, that turns really peculiar. It says, why, why, why is he in such mean estate for ox and ass are feeding? Carol asked, why indeed? Why in a manger? Why this place of poverty? Why not a palace or, or even a guest room, but, but in some clearly very lowly structure? I think the answer, the answer beckons us beyond humble Bethlehem to, to witness his life or even greater lowliness. And, and not static lowliness, but, but increasing Loneliness. You see, Jesus, Philippians 2, 6, and 7, the previous two verses that are read from 
8 says this, But I was in the form of God. God did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. Wow, why this surprising appearance? To simply show us that it can be done? Surely this is more than a stunt. Why did he come? What, what was there here to accomplish? So we press forward in the story beyond the lowliness of the manger. What, and you see what? The life of a lowly sacrifice. With no place to lay his head. It's Luke 9, 58. I have no place to call home. No place to lay my head. And finally to the ultimate place where he was condemned unjustly as a criminal, stripped of his garments, raised up to the most odious of public executions and being found in human form, he humbled himself by coming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Some may say that you souring the brightness and the joy of Christmas. Well, will we sing what? This last part, nails, spear, shall pierce through. Can't, can't we leave that for Good Friday? Let us have our sweet, cuddly baby Jesus at Christmas. No nails, no blood, no death. No, no, let's leave that alone. But I'm here to tell you, word made flesh, coming without a cross in the view, is not good news. <coughs> the light and joy of Christmas are hollow if we, we sever the link between Bethlehem and Galilee. The cross he bore for me and for you. In, the, in this first advent here, he came not in judgment but in mercy. He did this for you. Christmas is for only you because his life was for you and his death was for you and his triumphant resurrection on the other side was for you. Nails, spears shall pierce through him. doesn't ruin Christmas. It gives, it gives Christmas its power. Bring you to the first, the sub point under what child is this? Peasants come in kings. The blank there is peasants. What child is this? The peasants come in kings. In the Carol's final verse, we sing, So bring him incense, gold, and myrrh. 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 Wow. Bring him incense, gold, and myrrh. I'll get it right. Hang on. Grand Josh, I'll get it. Give me that look like, what did you just say? So bring him incense, gold, and myrrh. Come peasant, king, to own him. Lowly shepherds are here. And when the lofty of his own, people won't bow the knee. We talked a little bit last week how they're not really kings. Okay? But 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 they're they're high. They're real. When when when, when the own people won't bow, foreign dignitaries, they, they come from afar. And fountain and mountain and, and they honor him by laying down their treasures. Peasants come in kings, the weak and the strong. The wise and the foolish, the low and the, and the despised. They kneel side by side with those who are powerful and nobly born. What's the point? The manger is for all sinners. Because the cross is for all sinners. And this, it's, it's all too much for simple fact-finding, cool-headed analysis and calculated articulations. This stuff is what? This is the stuff of singing. Alright? This is the time to say, what child is this? An unexpected Savior asks us the question, what child is this? But it also, it also brings us to our second point. How the Word became flesh. To get to the point of what child is this, we have to see that the Word became flesh. He John 1, 14. Jason, I give you that one. Thumbs up? No, maybe. I may be ahead of you. If I didn't, it's fine. Uh, John 1, 14 says this. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Two big Christmas theology words, okay? Uh, there's others. But there's two big words I want to discuss today. Neither is difficult as it sounds, okay? When I say these words, you're going to go, Whoa. What's he talking about? That must be a learned man. Well, they am not. Okay? But I want us to understand them. It's not, it's not really important that we know the words as much as it is the meaning behind it. The first is incarnation, which refers literally to the infleshing of the eternal Son of God. Jesus putting on our flesh and blood. All right? And becoming fully 
human. The doctrine of reincarnation claims that the eternal second person of the Trinity took on humanity in the person of Jesus the Nazareth. A helpful way to remember that, the key aspects of the incarnation is the statement of John 1, 14. The Word became flesh. The Word refers to the eternal divine Son of God, who in the beginning with God, according to John 1, 1, who himself is God, from eternity past, the Son of God has existed in perfect love, joy, and harmony, and fellowship of the Trinity. Like the Father and the Spirit, he, he is Spirit in no material substance until taking on our humanity. But at the Incarnation, he entered into creation as man. He became a first century Jew. Because, now became doesn't mean that he, that he ceased to be God at this time, okay? In becoming man, he didn't forsake his divine nature. No, it, that's not possible. Rather, he became man by taking on human nature in addition to his divine nature. You see, it's essential to the incarnation to get that. And important to our theology to recognize that divinity and humanity are not mutually exclusive. God can be both at the same time. The Son of God didn't have to choose between being God and being man. He, he could be both. The eternal word became human without ceasing to be God. Flesh isn't merely a reference to the, to, to, to the human body, but the entirety of what makes up humanity, body, mind, emotions, will. Hebrews 2, 17, Hebrews 4, 15. They teach us to... to they teach us that Jesus had to be made like us in every aspect. Except for what? Except for our sin. In the incarnation, everything proper to humanity was united to the Son of God. The Son of God did not only become like man, he actually became true, truly and fully human. Okay? If the first term of incarnation was familiar, then perhaps the second term will be less so. I'm going to give it to you. Then I'm going to explain. You have to write it down. Hypostatic union. Whoa. Yeah, I told you I was supposed to have another slide. So, there you go. Hypostatic union. Basically, here's what it means. It's your, it's your fill-in. Two natures, one person. Two natures, one person. It's not intimidating. It means it's easier than it sounds, okay? Our English adjective, hypostatic, comes from the Greek word hypostasis. I'm getting a little Greeky for you, Jay. The early church came to use this theological term it related to the distinctiveness within the Trinity. To refer to something like the English word person. All right. So in this context of hypostatic union, now follow me. Hypostatic means personal. The hypostatic union is the personal union of Jesus' deity and humanity. Okay, one person, one union, two natures. One fully human, a fully human nature, and one fully divine nature. And so that's all that means. What the doctrine of the hypostatic union teaches is that these two natures are united in one person in the God-man. Jesus, who's not two persons, but one person. He's one. The hypostatic union is the joining, mysterious as it is as humans, of the human to the divine in one person in the form of Jesus. What's the significance? You say, why the fancy terms? Why bother with this stuff? At the end of the day, the term itself is not essential. You don't have to remember that. But the concept behind it is infinitely precious. It's inspiring worship and guarding us from, from error. It's immeasurably sweet and awe-inspiring to know that Jesus' two natures are perfectly united in one person. Jesus is not divided. He's not two people. He's one person, one Christ. As the Chalcedonian Creed, a statement issued by the Church Council, AD 451, it declares his two natures are without confusion, without change, without division, and without separation. Basically, Jesus is one. That means Jesus is one focal point for our worship. In other words, because of this hypostatic one person union, Jesus Christ exhibits an unparalleled magnificence for us as all humans. No person satisfies the complex longings of the heart like the God-man. God made our human souls in such a way that we will not be, what, eternally content with that which is only human. 
And in our finite humanity, we also need a point of contact with the divine. God was glorious long before he came in a man of Jesus. But we are human, and an unincarnate deity doesn't connect with us profoundly as a God who became human. The idea of God who never became man will not satisfy the human soul like the true God-man who did. But beyond just gazing from afar at that spectacular singular person who is Jesus, we also have the gospel making the revelation that what the reason why he became the God man was for who? It was for us. The personal union of God and man in him is personal for us. He's fully human nature joined to eternally. Divine nature is permanent proof that Jesus, in perfect harmony with his Father, is unstoppable for us. The, the eternal Son of God, without ceasing to be God, took on a fully human nature to his one person, and he demonstrated his love for us, and then while we were still sinners, he died for us. That's Romans 5. Jesus didn't just become man because he should, or because he could. This was no circus stunt. It wasn't just for show. He became man, in the words of the ancient creed, for us and for our salvation. That's why he did it. That's why there's a hypostatic union. It's for us. What child is this? The peasants and kings come. The word became flesh. There's two natures into one person. What child is Well, Jesus is fully human. That's the third point today. Is the unexpected Savior is fully human. And the whole fullness of the deity dwells at the Father. Colossians 2 9. During Jesus' life on earth, no one questioned his humanity. They saw, they heard him for themselves, they touched him, they shared life with him. Then the question was, might this man somehow, some way be more than human? Could this man, improbable, imponderable as it seems, actually be God among us? But then the second generation of Christians and beyond, the question shifts. It was Jesus' divinity that was given. And they worshipped him. Within the church, at least, the truth of Jesus' divinity was, was soon neglected or even denied. We must avoid the same mistake. See, Advent is a ripe opportunity. Christmas time is a, a great time for us to reflect on not just the easy parts of incarnation, but also the uncomfortable or challenging aspects of what it means that our Lord is fully human. Not only did the Son of God have and still has a fully human body and mind, heart, and will. We're going to look at all four of those real quick. Okay? We're first, Jesus is fully human. We're first going to look at his body. He has a fully human body. That's your, your first sub point there. Under three. The New Testament is clear enough that Jesus had a human body first. I mean, John 1, 14 means this at least. The Word became flesh. His humanity became one of the first tests of the orthodoxy. He, he was born in Luke 2, 7, what we celebrate this time of year. He grew in Luke 2, verse 40 and 52. He grew tired in John 4, 6. He became thirsty in John 19, 28, hungry, Matthew 4, 2. He became physically weak in Matthew 4, 11, Luke 23, 26. He died in Luke 23, 46, and he had a real human body, which is now glorified after his resurrection, Luke 24, 39. He had a, he's fully human. Because why? We know that because he had a human body. Not only that, he had fully human emotions. Throughout the Gospels, Jesus clearly displays human emotions. When, 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 when he heard the centurion's word of faith in Matthew 18, what did he say? He marveled. He says in Matthew 26, 38, his soul is very sorrowful, even to death. So now he's marveled and he's sorrowful. In John 11, Jesus is deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. He's troubled and he even weeps. John 13, John 12, 27, he says, Now my soul is troubled. John 13, 21, he's troubled in the spirit. The author of Hebrews writes this, that Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears. Hebrews 5, 7. And we dare not look over the many remarkable expressions of Jesus' joy. I don't have time to reference them all. 
Matthew 18, Matthew 25 and 23, and Luke 10 and 15, and John 15 and 17, and Hebrews 1 and 12. You see, he has joy. Those are emotions. Jesus put on our feelings along with our flesh. He had a human body. He had human emotions. He also had a human mind. The waters get deeper here. Jesus had a human mind. He, Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. Luke 2, 52. Concerning that they or our no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Mark 13, 32. Now this may sound strange to ponder. Jesus is God growing and increasing wisdom. He's fully God. He knows everything. God's all knowing. How can he how can he grow in wisdom? But he does. With respect to his humanity. Even more so, the second text is striking for those of us with a high view of Christ. If Jesus is truly God and knows everything, how can Jesus not know when his own second coming will be? Well, the mature answer from church history has been this. In addition to being fully divine, Jesus is fully human. It is one person has both an infinite divine mind and a finite human mind. He's got a both. He, he can be said not to know things as in Mark 13, 32, because he's genuinely human. And human minds are not, they don't know all things. And Jesus can be said to know all things, as Peter says in John 21, because he's divine and infinite in his knowledge. I know it sounds like it's crazy and ironic and a great paradox, but it is. The scriptures plainly affirm that Jesus both knows all things and God doesn't know things as man. See, for the unique, two-natured, single person of Christ, this no contradiction, but this is this is the glory of the God-man. He's fully human. He's, he has a human body. He has human emotions. He has a human mind. He also has a human will. The last sub-point there, I'm point three is will. But the reality is that Jesus stretches our comprehension even further. You see, most difficult for us to grasp. We can grasp he has a human body. We can grasp he has human emotions. We can even grasp he has a human mind, but this human will, it's hard for us to understand. He tracks the relate by these two key texts. I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him, will of him, him who sent me. John 6, 38. And my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me, nevertheless, not as my will, but as you will. Matthew 26, 39. He has this divine will that is the will of his Father. But as man, he has this human will. That while being true human, is perfectly in sync with and submissive to the divine will. He still has it. But unlike us, he just doesn't give in to it. These truths are mysterious. You get it? They're beyond our experience, our understanding, and beyond we'll ever know as mere humans. But where this leads for us, those who call him Lord, is not to confuse him, not to confuse us. But what? where does it lead us? To worship. To say, what child is this? This is Christ the King. This is Christ the King. This unexpected Savior. He, he is fully God. He's fully man. Would, would, would we want to fix our eternal worship and praise on one who was not? This true human is Jesus-like in every respect. Human body, heart, mind, and will, except for sin. How amazing that the divine Son of God did not just take on part of your humanity at first Christmas, but no, what did he take? He took all of it. And he took the true humanity work from there, from the manger, all the way to the cross. Why did he do it for us? And now he's taken it into heaven as our pioneer to go before us into the presence of God. He took on the human body to save our bodies. He took on the human mind to save our minds. And without becoming human in his emotions, he, took, he couldn't have rescued ours. And without taking on a human will, he could not have saved our broken and wandering wills. In the words of the 4th century archbishop, that which he has not assumed, I mean, taken on himself, he is not healed. He became man in full, so they might save us in full. Final thought at the bottom, true human. Because Jesus is a true human, it equals true healing. Because he's a true human, we get true healing. That's what it's about. 
he became man in the pool so that he might save us in the pool. Let's pray. Father, these truths are, are past finding out. This unexpected Christmas, we follow where your word leads. But we don't pretend that our mere human experience can make full sense of it. But as we look at our unique and spectacular son, the, the God-man, we marvel. Well, what a child. What, what a savior. What, what a brother. What a friend. This man indeed worthy of our worship. And as God will be the focus of our happy praise in this season and throughout the rest of our lives. And even into eternity. In his name we pray. Amen. Jay's going to come and lead us in a song to worship. And you can stand, you can, you can sit, but I ask that you worship. We work, take this time to say, what child is this? It's the Christ. It's the King. The one who came for peasants and kings. Though the Word became flesh, why for me? He has two natures, but he's one person. He's fully God, fully man, and I want to worship him because of that. And his fully human aspect brings about true healing in my life. Take this time and just reflect and praise him. We have for communion. It's a little on the stage today to make room for a table. We come in and pray over that. And give thanks for the body that was broken for you. Give thanks for the blood that was shed for you. Yes, during Christmas time, you can give thanks for the death on the cross. Even more so. We'll take up an offering during this time as well. This is the time for us to respond in worship. So let me do so.
season we celebrate is Christmas. You God, let's not just stay there in Christmas this season. Let's focus on why you came. You came for us. You died for us so that we could have eternity with you. Okay? Help us to cling to that. Cling to that hope, that eternal hope. Thank you so much for your son. Let's then we pray. Amen. A couple things I need to go over with you real quick. Um, and this is not just for kids, but but kids, especially, and grown-ups, you want them. I have just these little candy canes. I know it's not anything special, but you do get a candy cane. Just come and grab one of those real quick. Um, and so, um, yeah. So Jace goes to come take those off. There you go. They're up here front after we're done. Uh, and you can come get those. Also, a couple other announcements. We still have live group on pause. Um, our services, we're going to share online, all that stuff. Um, and I sent out in a text that we're going to take a... Um, if you feel like giving some money towards um, our neighbor, mine and Nana's neighbor, Chris and Katie. Chris was in a real bad car wreck eight days ago. Uh, still in the hospital. Um, broke his spine in a couple places. Broke his neck, fractured his eye, fractured his head. And, uh, he's got a long recovery. So we're, we're just going to take up some money and go get Katie some gift cards for groceries and stuff like that. Okay? So if you want to give that to Miss Amanda or myself, we'll take care of that as well. You guys have been great. Perfect. Thank you for your breakfast. Thanks for helping out for all that. Um, you're dismissed. <laughs>